Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to Morning Prayer on this Wednesday in the week of the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Our readings for today are 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. The Gospel of Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to chapter 9, verse 1. The psalm is 119, verses 97 to 120, preface, proper 13. Please join us in our opening hymn. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly calm. service 
continues from page 32 of the Book of Common Prayer with the opening sentence and then on to page 35 and following. Let me hear of your loving kindness in the morning, for I put my trust in you. Show me the road that I must walk, for I lift up my soul to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continuing in prayer. Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and our joy. Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to offer you all worship, praise, and thanksgiving. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of all goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your peace and saving power through your Spirit. May we ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and ascended Lord. Amen. We continue with divinity. O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving and cry to him joyfully in songs. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the peaks of his of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands moved the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he himself is our God. We are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. If only you will hear his voice today, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness, and the people with his truth. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. And now we approach the Lord's throne of grace and mercy, seeking his forgiveness, for even in those things for which our consciences are free. Lord, we pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown. Things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Set us free, O God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Continuing with Psalm 119 verses 97 to 120. Oh, how I love your law. All the day long it is in my mind. Your commandments have made me wiser than my enemies, and it is always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. For your decrees are my study. I'm wiser than the elders because I observe your commandments. I restrain my feet from every evil way, that I may keep your word. I do not shrink from your judgments because you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. They are sweeter than honey to my mouth. 
through your commandments I gain understanding. Therefore, I hate every lying way. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and I am determined to keep your righteous judgments. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips and teach me your judgments. My life is always in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Surely they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. I hate those who have divided heart, but your law do I love. You are my refuge and shield. My hope is in your word. Away from me, you wicked. I will keep the commandments of my God. Sustain me according to your promise that I may live, and let me not be disappointed in my hope. Hold me up and I shall be safe, and my delight shall be ever in your statutes. You sworn all who stray from your statutes. Their deceitfulness is in vain. In your sight, all the wicked of the earth are but dross. Therefore, I love your decrees. My flesh trembles with dread of you. I am afraid of your judgments. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Second Samuel, chapter 9, beginning at verse 1 and on to 13. David asked, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. And he was summoned to David, and king, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. The king said, is there anyone remaining of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, the kindness of God? Ziba said to the king, There remains a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, He is at the house of Machir, son of Emiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, son of Emiel, at Lodabar. Mehebosheth, son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said to Mephibosheth, He answered, I am your servant. David said to him, Do not be afraid. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you sh yourself shall eat at my table always. He did obeisance and said, What is your servant that you should look upon a dead dog such as I? Then the king summoned Saul's servant, Ziba, and said to him, all that belong to Saul and to all the house I have given to your master's grandson. You and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. 
but your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant will do. Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who lived in Ziba's house became Mephibosheth's servants. Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he always ate at the king's table. Now he was lame in both feet. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Continuing with the Benedictus, we pray. Blessed are you, Lord God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets, you promise of all to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you saw to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our lives. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and shall be forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, beginning at verse 34 and unto chapter 9, verse 1. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their lives? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of them, the Son of Man would also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take up your cross, the Savior said, if you would my disciple be, deny yourself the world for sin, and humbly follow after me. Take up your 
So, brothers and sisters, I thank you very much for this privilege to share my thoughts with you on this morning's gospel reading. I do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Taking up our cross. Previously, while on the way to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus had asked the disciples who they believe that he is, that Peter responded, you are the Messiah. Then Jesus began teaching them that the Son of Man would be rejected, subjected to suffering, and then killed. This was in keeping with the ancient prophecy of Isaiah. Peter then voiced his rejection of the Messiah being suffered to suffer such a fate. But Jesus rebuked him for his shallow uh, human response to which God had ordained and approved. And all of this may have triggered Jesus' stern discourse on what is expected and required of those who intended to be his followers. Jesus had to point out that just as the Savior was destined to suffer, so those who intend to follow him would not have a very easy life. Today's reading <clears throat> begins with Jesus calling not only the, his disciples but the crowd. This was, this was not a matter for his disciples only, but for anyone who wants to be his follower. They are to deny themselves and take up their course daily and follow him. The invitation, along with his burdens, is extended to every one of us, even today. Now at the time of Jesus, it was customary, it was a customary practice, for those who were to be crucified to carry the cross beam of the cross on their shoulder. The place to the place of the crucifixion. His words then give a clear indication of what would be what would his follow, followers would be must be prepared to do for his sake. Today, the only difference is that the wooden cross beam and the physical ordeals are not visible. But the privilege of being a follower of Christ would at times be very painful. And we must make up our minds to bear with it. We must be prepared to deny ourselves. No more are we to first satisfy our own desires and continue with our old ways and practices. And so the Apostle Paul tells us, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. When we deny ourselves 
and we take on we take on a new personality a new personality of service to Christ in serving others when we deny ourselves it becomes less difficult to take up our cross daily the issue which may have caused us concern and continual unpleasantness of heavers are no longer as difficult to cope with. Some are viewed from a more matured perspective. Some seem to fizz out and some we wonder what was all the fuss about. Yet there remains the undeniable fact that it is not easy to be, it's not ever easy to be a true follower of Christ. We may have to give up personal comforts, earthly things, earthly ties, social enjoyment, material riches, grand, grandiose, grand ambitions, and other issues of self. If we choose to become a follower of Christ. But this is not all that there is to consider. Christ warns that those who want to save their lives would lose it. To preserve our lives as we are accustomed is tempting. Living as comfortable as we can making our own self-centered choices and decisions, storing up to the extent that we may need more storage, is a common practice, and it is the way of life. Preserving this lifestyle is the surest way to lose the life which really matters. And in any event, when the end of the physical life comes, we cannot preserve it for another moment. And we cannot take whatever we have to enjoy it in the life to come. On the other hand, Jesus assures that those who lose their life for his sake and for the sake of his word and teaching will save it. This assurance is that those who surrender and this assurance is that those who surrender and pour out their lives for him by dedicating their lives to him totally, that is, losing their lives for him, and those who, who just as earnestly dedicate themselves to evangelizing would be saved unto eternal life even if they lose their physical life in the process. Then a better life is assured and awaits the faithful. Fanny J. Crosby expressed the thoughts as she wrote, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. O oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heirs of salvation, Purchase of God, born of the Spirit, wash in His blood. Miss Cosby understood that this requires, that this life requires that perfect submission to, to Christ. Yes, at rest in Christ to carry our cross. As Jesus continues, He takes, He makes the point that it is futile to do otherwise, as he asks the question, for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? There is nothing imaginable which can be traded for eternal life. There could be no gain in obtaining the wealth of the entire world and losing the free gift of a life in God's kingdom. The soul is invaluable and its resting place is beyond this world. And it is beyond this world and beyond this world 
to purchase. Eternal life is therefore worth more than the world could ever offer, for nothing can even compare with the gift of eternal life. Our Lord summed up his disclosure with a clear and stern warning to all. He realized that some believers or even the disciples may turn away or even stumble in their discipleship due to fear, due to shame. Jesus warned that those who seek to invade, to evade, sorry, embarrassment on account of being ashamed of him in this shameless, immoral, and ungodly generation would find themselves being ashamed by him when he returns. At that time, he would come in, in his glory, in the presence of his Father and the company of angels. This certainly will not be a time to find ourselves being ashamed of by the one who came to save us, the only one who could spare us from eternal death. In conclusion, Jesus told his listeners, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who had not tasted it until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. Some may have thought or misunderstood that Jesus was, was saying that, the, that his, his second coming would be in their lifetime. Actually, Jesus was, however, referring specifically to Peter, James, and John, who were witnesses to his transfiguration. At that occasion, the kingdom of God was revealed in the radiance of the glorified body of Christ. Through him, the reflection of the kingdom was radiated with power, and his glory shone through. In spite of all of this, Jesus, in his ministry, in his life on earth, remained a faithful servant. He remained faithful to serve. My friends, our reading point us to be less self-centered and to be more willing to serve each other, even in the worst and most difficult of times and situations. Christ guides us that by living for him, we are assured of a life with him. That if we identify boldly with him in this mortal life, he would identify with us in the presence of his Father and the angels when he comes again in his glory. My brothers and sisters in Christ, his recognition of us would allow us God's free gift of eternal life. If he does not identify with us, then we are doomed. So let us strive to present ourselves worthy of his coming, worthy of his recognition, by living, or by living out his lives and teaching. By living out our lives in his teaching. And may God grant us his grace and courage so to do. The Lord be with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
as we continue. Let us confess our faith as we pray together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. By way of intercession, we pray for God's abundant blessing upon his people. We pray for peace in the world. We pray that all wars would cease. That the hearts of men would soften towards each other. And that peace would increase. Good sense would prevail. Thanking God for always for the control of the and eradication of the virus, bringing an end to the death and the sufferings. We pray earnestly for the Anglican Church worldwide, for the well-being of our leaders. In the province, we pray for the Archbishop, the Most Reverend Howard Gregory. In our diocese, we pray for our diocese and bishop, the right Reverend Claude Berkeley, thanking God for him, for strengthening him to continue his work. We pray for all the retired bishops, for, for Calvin and Clive, and we also pray for all the retired clergy. Today, in the diocese and cycle of prayer, we pray for the Reverend Dr. Eric Thompson, the Reverend Winston Roberts, the Reverend Dr. Patricia Seely, the Reverend Echukwu Azukome, Brother Ike. We pray for the Diploma in Pastoral Studies and the diocesan program in the Institute of Pastoral Care at Codrington, Codrington College. We also pray for the United Theological College of the West Indies and all seminarians and the evangelists. In our parish, we continue to pray for the well-being of all those who serve in the parish bringing to our Father, our parish priest, the Reverend Father, Dr. Anders Maxwell, the Reverend Father Titus Akrali, the Reverend Presbyter Pontifex Angie, and we pray that God will help them through their ordeals and bring them to good health. We pray for the deacons, Deacon Rodwin Fanfare, and Deacon Mark Haynes. We pray for all the laity and all the church groups, remembering today especially 
canon of our rec former rector, canon Jamet Hazelwood, who turned 100 on Saturday 5th. And we pray that God will continue to bless him and preserve him. That God will make his face to shine upon his servant, Jamet. We bring before our Lord the congregations of the parish seeking his assistance in the rejuvenation of the parish at Oropoon for the well-being of the parish at Lopino, Maloney, St. Aidan's and St. Mary's. Remember the sick and the letting them know that they are never alone in their sickness. And they should use this very valuable time to draw closer to God. We continue with suffrage C. Save your people, Lord, and bless your inheritance. Govern and uphold them now and always. Day by day we bless you. We praise your name forever. Lord, keep us from all sin today. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy. Lord, show us your love and mercy, for we put our trust in you. In you, Lord, is our hope, and we shall never hope in vain. The preface, proper 13. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, O Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Returning to page 45, we pray. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves this day. Let your presence be with us this close. Strengthen us to remember that in whatever good works we do, we are serving you. Give us a diligent and watchful spirit, that we may seek in everything to know your will, and knowing it, may gladly perform it, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Prayer of Dedication Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all persons in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us evermore. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And so my brothers and sisters, our morning prayers come to heaven and pray that the time has been edifying. Let us now go in peace and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.